Hey everybody, it's Matt Shu from Upright Health and today I want to look at a diagram to show you where some of the major issues are with the current uh, diagnostic process with uh, FAI and the whole concept of FAI. So um, I've had a lot of discussions and I've read a lot of anecdotes um, about people's FAI experiences. Uh, we've had a lot of people actually come here and tell us what their um, experiences have been like. Uh, we've had email exchanges with a lot of people and we've read a lot of blog posts. And, and the stories um, all draw a pretty clear picture and it all follows what's generally accepted as the um, normal diagnostic guidelines that we've seen um, written about online from different uh, medical sources. So this flowchart is to kind of break things down for you so you can see why there is a pretty um, pretty strong bias to end up recommending surgery for this for hip problems. Okay, so <clears throat> this diagram is going to break it down really easy. So, do you have hip pain? If the answer is no, then probably no surgery. You're probably probably not even asking anybody about what to do about your hip. If the answer is yes, um, what's very interesting is that how it started doesn't seem to really matter when it comes down to FAI. So when you read the, the descriptions of the diagnostic process, a lot of times they'll say, well, the doctor will get a history, you know, find out what happened to lead to this issue, and that's part of the, um, part of the whole process. What's interesting, though, is that um, it doesn't really matter how it started. So you will hear stories from people who say, well, it was sudden, I hurt myself, I fell, I tripped, I was doing jujitsu, I surfed, I hit something funny, and then my hip just didn't feel right after that. You'll also get stories of people who have this slow progressive issue where, you know, sitting was uncomfortable for a while and then it got less comfortable and then it got really uncomfortable and now it's hurting all the time. Regardless of whether it was sudden or slow, the result is the same. We still move down the ladder, we move down the chart to range of motion problem. So this is uh, supposed to be another piece of the puzzle that helps you identify whether or not somebody has hip impingement. What's interesting here is you can see a wide range of people um, who have a lot of range of motion problems and you can also have people who have basically no range of motion problems. Um, the people who have a little or a lot tend to be male, um, just from my, from my experience, and the people who don't really have a range of motion problem tend to be uh, women. So in the FAI fix we, we refer to um, a common scenario one, which is people who are pretty um, tight and inflexible. Those are these people on this range. And then the nun is uh, our common scenario two, where people are uh, generally women and generally already quite flexible, but still feel pain, especially when doing things like sitting or just, you know, resting or standing, just doing normal stuff. They just feel like the hip is not working correctly. And then when they go to an end range, even though the end range is further than maybe somebody over here, they're still feeling discomfort and pinching. Um, so regardless of the range of motion, you still get to move down the flow chart, which gets you to x-ray MRI pathology. And so uh, if you get a totally clean x-ray and a totally clean MRI, you get to go to the no surgery candidate uh, column because uh, it's not a bone problem, it's not a labral problem, so nobody can um, say there's something to operate on. The problem here is that a no is extremely, extremely, extremely unlikely. So uh, when you do x-rays and MRIs on people who are totally without hip symptoms, you have a very high prevalence rate of finding, uh, of um, pathologies. So for example, um, labral tears, uh, in some, this is one paper that showed uh, labral tears chondral defects and subchondral cysts in, um, I believe it was a group about, of about 40 people, they found, first of all, these are 40 asymptomatic people, they found labral tears in 69%, chondral defects uh, in 24%, subchondral cysts in 16%. So uh, you're able to find these things in people who have no problems. So it's highly unlikely that those are the cause of people's problems. If we say black hair causes migraines, and we find out that there are three billion people with black hair and no higher migraine rate than anybody else, then it seems unlikely that black hair is the thing causing the problem. If we find out that over half the population has um, labral tears without symptoms, it's unlikely that this is the thing that's causing people's uh, hip pain. 
if we find out a quarter of the population has these chondral defects without symptoms, it's highly unlikely that that is the cause of people's hip issues, and so on. So FAI morphology, this is actually FAI bone shapes, CAM, pincer impingement bone shapes. Um, depending on the study you read, and depending on the size of the study, and when it was published, you'll find there are incidence rates of 25 to 83 percent. I've seen sometimes, I think with pincer impingement, where this number goes lower, but uh, a really recent 2015 study on an older population with well-functioning hips without problems showed um, an 83 percent prevalence rate uh, for uh, FAI bone morphology. And that's people who don't have the symptoms. So it's super, super unlikely, it seems, that the bone morphology is the thing that's causing the problems. However, it's highly likely that you will find it in x-ray and MRI scans. So uh, you're going through this process that assumes that this, that this right here is the big deciding factor, right? This, though, is heavily, heavily, heavily uh, biased or highly, highly likely to show you some sort of pathology, even though pathology, these pathologies have not been shown to actually lead to uh, problems, okay? So you're getting here, this is kind of the hinge, hinge moment. This is where you can get a no. After this, um, if you get any of these things in your X-ray or MRI, it's basically a, a slam dunk because now you go, okay, x-ray, MRI, pathology, yes. You might go to PT, but at this point, it's already assumed that, that the bone problems and the, the labral tears are the actual cause of your problem. So here, what we find and what we've heard and what we've seen is that a lot of the times the protocol is not really geared towards uh, dealing with any sort of muscle imbalance issue, and actually a lot of the protocols tend to exacerbate the problem because there isn't enough attention paid to how muscles are being treated, how they're being activated, and whether or not they're being uh, worked with in a, in a precise way. So assuming this fails, um, or assuming you did it at all, right, um, if it fails, you end up here at this injection thing. So injection relief, do you get relief from an anesthetic injection? This is supposed to determine whether these things are actually the root cause of your pain. Um, so the argument is made that if you inject the hip joint and it relieves the pain, then the pain is actually coming from one of these pathologies in the joint. That would be a reasonable conclusion if, in fact, any research had been done that showed that that was true. Um, and so some research has been done to see whether the injection relief is predictive of people getting relief from a surgery. And what the, the studies on that show is that, in fact, whether you have a yes or no, whether it relieves your pain or not, doesn't actually predict whether or not it's going to be uh, a successful surgery, meaning relieving your pain. What they find is that a no actually means it's less likely that the surgery is going to work. Uh, they find a yes doesn't predict anything. Also, um, what you'll find when you look closely into the research about injections and determining whether or not these things cause pain, uh, what you find is that the studies on injections don't, um, basically they show that the injections can't tell you whether or not these are causing your pain. So while this is supposed to clarify this, this doesn't. And unfortunately, as you see drawn here, the yes and no, um, in practice what we've heard and what we've seen is that if, it's a, if you do get relief, you're told, well, okay, that's a slam dunk, go get surgery. If you get a no, you're still told that, well, you, you still have the, the labral tears and the bone shapes, so you might as well do the surgery even though the injection didn't work. So you still end up here. So that's why a lot of uh, attention and focus um, on the research that I, I sh that I share on this channel um, is about x-ray and MRI pathology. It's because this is the key piece that results in you moving all the way down the ladder. Up here, doesn't really matter, right? If it's sudden, none of that matters. It's this, and this is the key piece where cause and effect have not been established. These things are common in people with absolutely no symptoms. So it doesn't make sense to say, well, actually, you know, everyone has these things, but if you have pain, then these things matter, right? Again, that's like saying, well, Black hair doesn't cause migraines, unless you have migraines all the time. If you have migraines all the time and you have black hair, then black hair is probably causing your migraines. But for the most part, black hair doesn't matter. 
unless you have migraines. Right? It's, it's a very weird logic and it doesn't actually make sense. It's like saying, well, everybody has five fingers and the five fingers don't matter. Uh, unless, of course, you have elbow pain because then having five fingers makes your elbow hurt, but only for people whose elbows hurt. Right? There's a, there is no logic to that statement. So um, look very closely at this and, and I hope that this clarifies um, why I, I speak so much about these issues. Um, the, 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 the logic of the diagnostic process has basically made it so that everything hinges on finding these things, but these things have not been shown to actually lead to problems. So these are things that, in, in my opinion, probably don't matter. And based on the science, they don't really matter. What does matter is what's actually controlling movement of the hip joint. And what controls the hip joint is the muscles around the hip joint. And that's not really a point of debate, right? The thing that influences the motion of my elbow joint are the muscles that are around the elbow joint. The muscles that control the hip joint are the thing that affect how a hip joint moves. So it makes much more sense to, instead of looking at these things that don't have a causal relationship, um, look at the muscles and figure out how to work with the muscles in a way that improves your comfort level and improves the quality of your life. So I hope this flow chart kind of clarifies all that stuff for you. I hope it, it makes sense. And I hope you remember that pain sucks. Life shouldn't.